The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our series, Key Battles in the Revolutionary War. The last key battle, Yorktown, is over, but the war isn't over. It still has to be concluded with a formal peace treaty, and there are things happening until that happens. So in this episode, we're going to see what happens until war is officially over. Then we're going to see what happens to all of these very interesting generals, officers, political figures, and all the other people we saw in the Revolutionary War. So, James, what happens after Yorktown? After Yorktown, a truce was declared in America. Although that doesn't mean there was no fighting at all. There were some skirmishes uh, from time to time. And one of, in, in one of these skirmishes, John Lawrence, who, we've, who we have mentioned repeatedly, the young aide to uh, General Washington, a close friend of Hamilton, friend of Lafayette. Lawrence was tragically killed on August 27, 1782 in South Carolina. He was very young. I think he was about 25 or so. And it was really a devastating blow to Washington because he was like a son to Washington, as were Hamilton and Lafayette. And of course, once again, I have to mention that Lawrence is one of the main characters in the first part of the Hamilton musical. <laughs> there it is. I brought it again. I did it again. <laughs> so take a drink, listener, if you can. <laughs> I got to work that into every episode. It's a rule. Right. We're running out of time. We got to do as much as we can. All right. And I will say this, the, the Hamilton musical, I, I, I'm again, I'm, we're recording in July of 2019. It's playing in certain places. You have to practically uh, inherit some wealth from your rich uncle or, <laughs> or strike oil or rob a bank. I don't recommend that third one, but you, it's very hard to pay for the tickets. They're very expensive and they're hard to get. But you can go onto YouTube and you can listen to the entire soundtrack also on Spotify. I'm sure there's other places as well. And even if you don't like hip hop, uh, I encourage you to give it a listen because it's really imaginative. It's fun and there's different kinds of music. It's not all hip hop. And anyway, so check it out. Hamilton, the musical. All right. John Lawrence again is killed. Very, very just senseless. It was really unnecessary for them to be fighting, but he was a very, he was one of these young men that wanted glory on the battlefield. And unfortunately he didn't get it over the course of the war, about 200 and, 230,000 men roughly served in the Continental Army, though never more than 48,000 at any one time, and never more than 13,000 at any one place. The sum of the colonial militias numbered upwards of 145,000 men. So w even though you had hundreds of thousands of people serving in the Continental Army, as we've talked about again and again, they always were coming and going and leaving and going home and some deserted. So uh, even though it, it, you had so many serving, there were never that many at one time. Now let's talk about casualties. Casualty figures are extremely unreliable, very difficult to pin down. They were hard enough for the Civil War, but for this, it's even harder. And all the in all, the Americans suffered about probably 33,000 casualties, including about 6,800 killed, 6,100 wounded, and 20,000 captured. That captured figure is huge. More than half of those who were captured died of disease in captivity. And I get these numbers from the American Battlefield Trust, in case anybody's wondering. So you may find different numbers. Every single source is going to have slightly different numbers because it's just impossible but so yeah the disease thing was huge in our civil war series we talked about how two soldiers died of disease for every one that was killed in a battlefield wound and in this war it was even more and i don't have an exact ratio three to one four to one or anything like that but uh, disease was even a worse problem all right now what about british casualties well again the data is unreliable they, they weren't thinking about us, Scott, when they, <laughs> when they were, it's like they didn't think, oh, we need to put this down for posterity's sake. 
Uh, the total casualties for British regulars fighting in the Revolutionary War is probably about 24,000 men. So fewer total casualties than the Americans. No one knows how many were killed, wounded, or missing. I'm not even going to put in a guess. Approximately 1,200, well, that's 1,200 Hessian soldiers were killed. 6,300 died of disease. And another 5,500 deserted <laughs> and settled in America afterwards. And again, we talked about that a couple times before, how Hessians, uh, once you got them over here, it was sometimes hard to keep them in, uh, in the army. Now, when the surrender at Yorktown occurred, Lord North, the British prime minister, was absolutely, it was like he'd been punched in the gut. He was devastated. He, he almost collapsed physically, and he said, oh, God, it is all over. Now, King George, for his part, was determined to continue the war, but Parliament was losing its enthusiasm. The House of Commons voted to cease funding for the war on February 28th. This would be 1782. Lord George Germain, who was the Secretary of State for the North American colonies, he resigned, and eventually Lord North and the rest of the cabinet followed suit. So, in other words, the loss of the, the Revolutionary War brought down the British government and it would have to be replaced by another one. Yeah, and uh, one thing I want to mention before we get to the peace treaty is what happens to Tories in America and Loyalists, because we saw at the end of the war, as it goes south, with Yorktown, that things become scorched earth and fighting not on the military scale, but simply between Patriot or Loyalist families becomes absolutely brutal. So after Cornwallis surrenders, Tory leaders in New York realized that they had chosen the wrong side in the war. They had hitched their cart to the wrong horse, we could say, and that there just wouldn't be a place for them in an independent America. Wilmington, North Carolina, was evacuated by the British a month after Cornwallis' surrender, and Patriots took revenge on many Tories that had been left behind. One Tory who had earlier hanged a Patriot was, from one account, split in half by a sword blow. Yeah. So other Tories took notice, and they didn't stick around. And not to get too far ahead, but as James was talking about, the political will is collapsing in Britain to continue the war, even though George wanted it. Cornwallis also did, too. Uh, he sailed to London in 1782 to present proposals uh, for a renewal of the war on a huge scale. But when the government of Lord North falls and it's replaced, then well, when they demand an end to all offensive operations in North America and want peace negotiations, uh, then there's just no possibility of continuing to prosecute the war. There are still some guerrilla combat um, events that happen after Yorktown. Uh, in South Carolina alone, there were 56 battles and skirmishes in 1781 and 1782 before the British evacuate Charleston in December of the year. There are also Indians, mostly Cherokee and Creek, still fighting for the British in the South. And the frontier war that raged in the last months of the Revolution in the Battle of Sandusky, uh, this stands out. It was a two-day struggle in northern Ohio in June 1782, where William Crawford and 500 Pennsylvania militiamen uh, attacked a group of 300 British Rangers and Indians. So still some things going on, but then it mostly stops at the Treaty of Paris. So what's going on with the Treaty of Paris? Okay, again, after Yorktown, at some point, the Congress named a negotiating team of Henry Lawrence, Father of John Lawrence, as we've seen before. First president. Yeah, yeah. Keep beating that <laughs> keep, dead horse. Keep that horse, yeah. <laughs> Henry Lawrence, John Jay, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. So all household names. Maybe not Lawrence so much, but we've tried to, we've tried to make him a household name for you. They sent them to uh, Paris because that's where you go if you're going to do a peace deal. It's, my students always joke with them. I'm sorry there's so many treaties of Paris. <laughs> it's like, it seems like every other treaty that the U.S. is involved with is Paris. But uh, So John Jay wanted a unilateral treaty with the British. In other words, he didn't want the French to be involved. The French very much thought they should be involved. They said, hey, we, we helped win this war. We're your allies, so we want a, a role in the peace process. But even though they're in Paris, the final treaty did not involve any French input at all, or at least not much. It was strictly a treaty between the the new United States of America and Great Britain. 
On November 30th, 1782, the Treaty of Paris was drafted and it was signed on September 3rd, 1783, so almost a year later. And it contained the following provisions. So, number one, Britain acknowledged U.S. independence. So, the, Britain had to admit, yes, you are an independent nation. You, they, you, you're the United States of America, not British colonies anymore. Number two, the western boundary of the U.S. was set at the Mississippi River. And that's a huge gain. That is a lot because if you think of the original 13 colonies, well, they're pretty much just the e what we would call today the eastern seaboard, a little bit of upland property, but it goes way past the Appalachian Mountains all the way to the Mississippi, which is about at least double the land in the original 13 colonies. And, of course, the U.S. will have to deal with with how we're going to organize that territory and whatnot. But that's for another story. And the third thing was that the boundary between the U.S. and Canada was set. Obviously, Canada is going to stay part of the British Empire. They never, despite American efforts to force them to join or persuade them to join the rebellion, they, they didn't do it. So there you go. The treaty was unclear, though, about some issues, such as British troops who were stationed in the Northwest. And this is going to be a sticking point for quite some time, because even though Britain uh, acknowledges America's independence, or the U.S.'s independence, I should say, they leave troops on American soil. Some of that soil, some of that territory west of the Appalachians that goes out to the Mississippi, you're actually going to have br British forts with British soldiers. <laughs> Not cool, but anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that issue perhaps in another series, maybe. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about who – we saw who the winners were. The, the winners – and I'm using the term winner and loser just in terms of who came out the best, who gained what they wanted. And when I say losers, I don't mean that judgmentally, obviously, like loser. I don't mean that. I mean who uh, lost the most, who was going to have to struggle the most from here on. So obviously the winners are the, the American, the white American colonists, the, the, but, uh, let's look at the, the quote unquote losers. First of all, the loyalists, Scott's already mentioned this and, and we've talked about it in previous episodes, but thousands of loyalists left the country for Canada or England. 15,000 went to Nova Scotia alone. And interestingly enough, a lot of these loyalists who leave America they become some of the leaders of the future Canada. But many loyalists become part of the, or, or their descendants. Many loyalists become part, well, I already mentioned that, part of the governing elite of Canada. And you have to, again, I've said this before, but I think it, it merits mention one more time. I do feel a little sorry for the loyalists, especially since many of them were, they were, they felt like Americans. They were born in the American colonies. They lived their whole lives in the American colonies. They did business with each other as well as people who joined the rebellion. And they were not really, they didn't feel like British people. And yet some of them had to go live in London or other parts of Great Britain. Others had to go to Canada. So they had to leave their homes uh, that they lived in their entire lives and go start from scratch in a new place, which was unfamiliar. You know, Canada is way colder than most of the American colonies and Great Britain is a totally different environment as well. So you got to feel sorry for them, don't you, Scott? It's not as clear cut as we would like to think. And in yeah. our final episode, when we talk about effects of the revolution, there are some historians who say that there were significantly negative things that resulted from the revolution. And some argued that history may have turned out better in many aspects if the colonies had remained part of the British Empire. Yeah. And most revolutions do not turn out very well. Think about the French Revolution where everyone's guillotined. So I'd like to see their perspective on the ground of being suspicious about this whole enterprise. And I think there are many who would have defended loyal being a loyalist with as much pure heartedness as those who wanted independence. I mean, some were doing it purely for mercenary reasons like a Benedict Arnold, but then there were others who I think had pure motives in wanting to remain. So I want to give them credit. Yeah. I, this is one reason we talked about the Culper ring in a previous episode. This is one reason why Washington kept their identities so strictly confidential. And in some cases, the identities of some of them were not revealed for over a hundred years, they were not discovered, but 
because the Culper spies, they were all posing as loyalists. Mm -hmm. That was the whole way that they were able to get the information that they got. And Washington didn't want them there to be retributions against them. He had to be very careful with them. All right. So other losers, again, putting it in quotes, people (laughs) who are not judging these people, but um, they're, they're just people who things didn't go that well for them. They didn't benefit much from the revolution. These included slaves. We talked about how the British had had promised to free any slaves that ran away and came to British lines. Some of them ended up joining the British army, but a lot of them did not receive their freedom. The British double-crossed them. Not really like it was part of a plot to double-cross them. They just said, oh, sorry, we've got other things to do. We don't have, we can't deal with you. Some of them were returned into slavery. Others fled to Nova Scotia or to London, but others were sold back into slavery in the West Indies, or they were prevented by from leaving by Americans. So a lot of slaves really were going to suffer as a result of the war. And also Native Americans. You know, I don't have that in the notes here, but it comes to mind that most Native Americans sided with the British. And believe you me, there are going to be retributions against them for that from uh, from the new Americans, the new American army, and there's going to be a lot of attacks on Indian settlements and whatnot. <clears throat> All right. Plus, there's no restraint on their westward, the Americans' westward expansion. The British government, we talked about this a long time ago. I think it was in the first or second episode where the British government in 1763 had essentially told Americans, you cannot, you're not allowed to go and settle west of the Appalachians. Now, obviously, that didn't prevent any Americans from going. A lot of people went anyway, but that trickle is going to turn into a flood after the, the war is over and, the, and America becomes independent. There's nobody to tell them not to go anymore. And so, so things didn't turn out too well for the Native Americans. Uh, one other thing, Congress abolished the Continental Army in 1784. They, there was a fear of standing armies that they would be used to tyrannize the population, and that left only a small force at Fort Pitt and another at West Point. So there you go. What are some other things that are happening? I understand there is a conspiracy afoot with um, soldiers that don't think they've received the pay they should. Yeah, this is a great story. One footnote to the Revolutionary War. Some of Washington's officers who were frustrated by the slowness and inefficiency of Congress and their failure to pay the soldiers, decided to take over the government and make Washington a king. Oh, man, doesn't that run against the spirit of the revolution? It's like, we don't want a king. Oh, by the way, Washington, you want to be king? But That's one of the things that makes Washington so great is he refused. Washington could have been King George I of the United States, but... He said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is why <laughs> this, the whole point of this revolution was to not have a king. I am not going to become a king. I have no interest. Thanks, but no thanks. So these guys were going to have a meeting. Well, Washington called a meeting of his officers. And this was at Newburgh, New York. And it's spelled wrong in the notes here, but it's N-E-W-B-U-R-G-H, one word. Newburgh, New York. And at this At this meeting of all the officers of the Continental Army, Washington made a speech. And in this speech, he urged them not to try to take over the government. And during the speech, at one point, he stopped. And he said, gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. And this, it was probably a little bit of a theatrical gesture. He may have planned it this way. I don't think it was just... An accident, you know, just, oh, yeah, I need my glasses. Nobody ever, almost nobody had seen Washington with glasses before. He, let's see, he was 50, 51 years old at this time. At the beginning of the revolution in 1775, he'd only been 43. So this is nine years later, and it it took a toll on Washington, just like war does on anybody. And when they saw him, this beloved commander whom they loved so much, how he'd kind of become... I'm not going to say old and decrepit. I'm not, I'm not, actually, he's the same age as me right now. So I'm definitely not going to say that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but how the war had aged him and just how he'd, his hair had started to turn gray and he started to need reading glasses, that just melted their hearts. It moved the audience literally to tears. And after that, they gave up the conspiracy. So <laughs> I don't know if it was just that one 
gesture on Washington's part. I'm sure the entire speech had a play in it, but it's just that it's amazing how one impression you get or one moment can make such big changes. It's a great story. Uh, when I tell that story in my classes, I, I literally pull out my own reading glasses and put them on, and <laughs> it, it, I think it helps. It, it's just a great moment. In October of 1783, Washington led the army to New York City as the British were pulling out. There, he announced his intention to retire from the army. See, some people were concerned that Washington might do what a lot of leaders in the past had done. Think about Caesar. Uh, Napoleon would do this in the future. Uh, he had obviously he wasn't a, that time had not come yet. But you think about Oliver Cromwell. Uh, military leaders turned themselves into essentially dictators or kings or whatever. Washington, there was uh, people wondered, is he going to do it? But he didn't. Instead, not only does he not take power, but he gives up all the military power that he had and just goes home, kind of like the old hero Cincinnatus in the Roman days. That uh, was just People were flabbergasted by that. I mean, people that really knew Washington were not surprised. They knew that he was probably going to do something like that. He had no desire for pow political power. He didn't really care that much. I mean, he cared somewhat about fame, but that wasn't what really drove him. He was just tired. He, he was ready for a break. So he rode south to Annapolis. There he formally resigned his commission to the Continental Congress and he returned to Mount Vernon. And again, I think that's something that makes Washington really great. Scott is um, not so much what he did, although he did a lot of things that do make him great, but also what he did not do. And what he did not do was take the reins of power, political power, supreme power, when it was offered to him. He, he turned it down. He returned to Mount Vernon, and he was hoping to settle down and sit under his own vine and his own fig tree and just be a gentleman farmer but we'll see if that happens <laughs> actually well everybody knows that's not going to happen spoiler alert it doesn't it doesn't happen he's going to get called back into service and here's an interesting anecdote upon hearing that washington had relinquished his power king george said if this is true then he must be the greatest man of the age so the i love that quote and king, so king george is right about one thing at least huh <laughs> Yeah, give him that. This is something that I see a lot about Washington. A listener requested I do an episode on his character, and I did my best not to write a hagiography that he was perfect. He obviously wasn't perfect. And Oh, no, no, no. But if people credit anything as the greatest mark of his character, it's not perseverance in situations like Valley Forge. It's not bravery in battle, because you can see lots of people like that throughout history that James mentioned, dashing brave military figures, the Napoleons, the Caesars in the 20th century in Africa. There are revolutionaries who successfully conquer others, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Idi Amin, whatever. But then they don't give up power and they become corrupted by it. And some of them become terrible tyrants by it and become completely delusional and suffer narcissism and megalomania. Washington gives it up, and that's where he's credited with greatness. Uh, I have a couple things I want to mention before we get into where are they now or where what happened to them issue. Uh, a funny story about Washington and then what happens with British troops. There's so much to say about Washington, but there's a story that I love. In 1787, Washington's called to be president of the Constitutional Convention. In September 15th that night, the Constitution had been finalized. Debates have been settled. It looks like the nation is finally on a firm course and things are set up. There was a farewell dinner for Washington before he planned on his yet another attempt to retire. So his friends in the first troop, Philadelphia City Cavalry, and other framers of the Constitution threw a party at the City Tavern in Philadelphia. <laughs> this is a bill from the party. It had 55 guests and included troops and politicians, friends and family, and 16 others who were working that night, including musicians and servers. The bill ended up being $300, which is about $17,000 in today's money. And the bill included 54 bottles of Madeira wine, 60 bottles of Bordeaux wine, 8 bottles of whiskey, 22 bottles of porter, eight bottles of hard cider, 
12 jugs of beer and seven bowls of punch. This is for 55 people. So they really knew how to drink back then. Yeah, and listener, make sure you know that this is not like fruit punch. This is not Kool-Aid. <laughs> this is spiked punch. We could argue about the ABV being lower. So it might be apples to oranges, but when we're talking about 8 million oranges, it's still a lot of alcohol. So <laughs> yes, I mean, they knew how to pack it in back then. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. One last thing, just before we get to the character sketches, uh, James had mentioned that the British linger on afterwards, and this is some of the, there, there are still some diehard people who think that the British could return, kind of like that Japanese soldier who is on an island until the 70s, thinking World War II is still going on. The British do continue to maintain a presence in the Northwest Territory, even when the British depart Staten Island and Long Island on December 4th, 1783. They have presence in Ohio and Michigan, and they'd be finally driven out in the War of 1812, but the first few presidential administrations just ignore them. Uh, many Europeans thought the terms of the Treaty of Paris were overly genuous, generous to the, the United States, and some in Great Britain agreed, and there were some who wanted to recover its lost colonies. There were some British agents who agitated the Indians in the West against Americans, and some Englishmen thought that the United States would come to its senses and see that its early experiments and in independence had failed and return to British control. But what can I say? Some delusions die hard. And that was the case with the British. But, well, that's all I have to say there. So should we look into what happens to different people after the war? Let's definitely do it. It's always fun to see what happened to them later in their lives. And did, as you said, did they have another famous career or did they go down the tubes? Yeah, well, much like our Civil War series, we went back and forth, and I think I handled the Union and James did the Confederacy. We'll flip the script here, so I'll do the quote-unquote bad guys. Sorry, British listeners, but um, <laughs> I'm I, I'm just from the perspective of the Patriot. You know, I think we've we've tried to say some nice things. Well, I'm going to talk about the British, and James will talk about the Americans. Well, to extend the fig leaf, I'll talk about King George, and I'll say this. I'm probably about as pro King George as you can find among Americans. And poor George, he is vilified by the Declaration of Independence, spends a significant length of time vilifying him. So he is vilified in an internal document, much like Judas Iscariot, who is eternally seen as a traitor because he is vilified in a one of the most most read documents in history, the New Testament. King George has a smaller but still significant status, but King George, like I said, was a, at least a man in his personal life, I would say, of incredible virtue. He didn't have a mistress, which uh, probably puts you in the top 1% of morality among monarchs in 18th century Europe. He uh, was a man of simple taste. He was called Farmer George. He loved agriculture. He was devastated by the loss of the American colonies. Later in his life, he struggles with mental illness. You see this in plays like The Madness of King George, and there are significant accounts where he doesn't recognize those around him. Sometimes he has moments of lucidity. Sometimes he doesn't. There have been a lot of articles written about what his madness could be. Some have thought it could be porphyria, which is a genetic disease that affected many other European royals, many of whom were basically all related. They were distinct cousins altogether. We don't know if this is triggered by the loss of colonies or if it was a degenerative condition. 
Uh, he'd had health problems like cataracts and rheumatism and dementia. He was permanently insane by 1812 and parliament essentially ran the empire and he had regents. There were regents on the throne as well. He died in 1820, age of 81, but despite being out of the public eye for many years at that point, he was close in the hearts of many British who loved him and many were heartbroken when the bells tolled and many knew that King George had died. His reign lasted a very long time. Only Elizabeth II and Victoria reigned longer than George did. So that is King George. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. All right, now I'm going to talk about Washington since he's kind of the number one guy uh, on the American side. Washington, gee, what could you say about him? There's so much that could be said. Uh, you could do an entire podcast series just on his life, and it has been done. But, but I'll just keep it brief here. After resigning from the Army, Washington lived at home in quote-unquote retirement. <laughs> he thought he'd hoped it would be retirement. But less than four years later, he was elected to the Constitutional Convention. The convention elected him as president, and that means president of the convention, meaning he's running the proceedings, not president of the U.S. at that time, there w because there wasn't such an office. But George Washington pres presided over the sessions of the con of the uh, sorry the Constitutional Convention. The following year, Washington was elected as the first president of the United States unanimously, and that was an office that he would serve two terms. He wanted to get out of it. He he originally thought he might just serve a year or two and then resign and hand it over to somebody else. And people said, no, serve your full term. And then he thought, well, I'll just quit after one term. And that was also rejected by, <laughs> by the people. Uh, so he served two terms, but he stepped down after the second term, setting a precedent that was followed by every American president until 1940. Franklin Roosevelt decided he needed a third term. But anyway... Uh, moving back to Washington, as president, he skillfully guided the nation through several crises, including the war between Great Britain and France, in which uh, he very wisely kept the U.S. neutral. There was also the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, we won't go into detail about that, but he put that down. He presided over a great economic expansion, and he saw three additional states come into the Union. That would be Kentucky, Tennessee, and Vermont. His original cabinet was a dream team of greatly talented men, although they were not in, they were definitely not in harmony. They definitely had differing opinions on how things needed to go. He had Washington I'm sorry, he had Thomas Jefferson as Secretary of State, Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury. Henry Knox became the Secretary of War, and Edmund Randolph from Virginia was the first attorney general. Uh, one of the most talented and brilliant cabinets we've ever had. As I've mentioned earlier, he stepped down after two terms. He returned to Mount Vernon in 1797, finally to get that retirement now that he's 65 years old. But sadly, two years later, he became ill and he died at the age of 67. And probably his doctors <laughs> did as much to hasten his passing as his actual uh, illness that he had. They bled him like crazy. It was it's an awful story, but that's what they thought needed to be done at the time. And in nearly all polls that rank the U.S. president, Washington finishes in the top three. He tends to come out second to Abraham Lincoln in most polls that I've seen, although occasionally you'll see him. Those are composite polls, polls that take a lot of different people's ratings and just mush them together into one. Sometimes he's number one. Sometimes he's number three. But, but there's no doubt that Washington set the standard and set for what a president should be at least in the early years of the nation. And we owe a lot to him. Even, even if Washington had never been president, he would still be a the famous American who led the um, Revolutionary War troops, who led the Continental Army. But he, he's one of these people who had two careers, each of which were s s hugely important to American history. And if you want to learn more about him as a physical specimen, I refer you to our series, Presidential Fight Club, which he also ranks very highly in, much like his polls as a president. We'll make you go listen to that if you want to see how tough he was and how, how good he would be in a fight. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely check that out, listener. All right. Well, the next person on the British side is Thomas Gage, who has a much shorter afterlife 
of the war than Washington does. He's inactive in the army until April 1781. Then he's reactivated to command a force assembled to protect against a possible French invasion with the French involvement in the Revolutionary War. Never occurs. His health declines after this, and he dies in 1787 at the age of 67, much like Washington. Same age. But uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about Thomas Gage. All right, moving on to the the number two man in the American side, Nathaniel Green. We we've, we've talked earlier about he's generally recognized to be the second greatest American general during the American Revolution. In 1781, Congress offered Green the newly created position of Secretary of War. Now I have to say this is before the Constitutional Convention. I didn't mention this at all, but the the United States, as we saw was governed by the Continental Congress from 1775 until 1781. And at that point, the Continental Congress disbanded itself and it was replaced by the Confederation Congress. The first U.S. Constitution was not the one we revere today, but it was actually an, a document called the Articles of Confederation, which gave it made for a much, much weaker central government. There was no president. There was no judicial system at least not a federal judicial system, there was just the Congress. So the Confederation Congress ran the country from 1781 until the Constitutional U.S. Congress took over in 1788 or 89, I think it was. So um, so this is when we're in the period of the Confederation Congress. So they offered Green the position of Secretary of War, and this was charged with overseeing the Continental Army, but he declined the position. Green didn't want to go into politics. He resigned from the Army in 1783 and returned to Newport, Rhode Island. Facing a large amount of debt, he relocated to the South to focus on the plantations that he had been awarded during the war as a gift for his service, and he made his home at the Mulberry Grove Plantation outside of Savannah. Though he had spoken against slavery early in his life, Green nevertheless purchased slaves to work his plantations. He later sold much of the land granted him by Congress to pay the expenses of the army. And he died of heat stroke in only 1786 at the age of 44. So a very promising life cut short uh, by a disease that today would not probably kill you. So that's Nathaniel Green. He could have been, I think, a great secretary of war. He might have even become president one day, but he just had no interest in it. All right. Well, the next person on the British side is William Howe, who prosecutes the war early on. And he and his brother, Richard, some thought that they had Whiggish sensibilities, which James described earlier, not in the form of political party sense, but more inclined to republicanism and less against a monarchy. They had had ties to the colonies and when we're talking about the carrot and the stick methods that the British are fighting the war, where you have stick, which is um, Cornwallis and definitely Tarleton, they were more of the carrots of being very cautious and measured where they fight, but they don't want to inflame colonial sensitivities against them. Who knows? Maybe if they had stayed on, it could have worked better or maybe not. We don't know. Well, in 1779, Howe and his brother Richard demanded a parliamentary inquiry into their actions in North America. Why did they demand it and not someone else bring it against them? Because why would you want someone investigating you? It's because they wanted to exonerate themselves against critics who thought that they had performed poorly and they want to show that they uh, had committed no wrongdoing. And the inquiry did exonerate them. In 1780, Howe lost his seat in Parliament, but was appointed Lieutenant General of Ordnance. And he became the Vice Count Howe after his brother Richard died. He remains in the Army until 1803. And he dies in 1814 at the age of 84. All right. So he lived a nice long life. Yes. Moving back back to the American side, let's talk about Henry Knox. Henry Knox succeeded Washington as overall commander of the Army after Washington resigned. Then he resigned his commission and was appointed secretary at war by Congress the next year. And again, this is prior to the Washington administration. This is, again, under the Articles of Confederation. Uh that was the position that was offered to Nathaniel Green, but Green turned it down. So Knox took it. 
After his inauguration as the first president of the United States, President Washington appointed Knox the first United States Secretary of War. Today, that's the Secretary of Defense. They changed the name of it in 1947. You know, Secretary of War, that sounds so aggressive. It sounds much nicer (laughs) if you say defense. Knox served ably as Secretary of War until January 1795, when he resigned and returned home to spend more time with his family. He also had a lot of financial issues. I remember reading, couldn't seem to stay out of debt. And he died in 1806, three days after swallowing a chicken bone. That is an awful way to die, Scott. (laughs) When you're the Secretary of War and have led troops in battle all your life, a chicken bone does you in. Yeah, (laughs) here's a guy that underwent hostile fire for years and years and years, but it, it ends up being taken down by a chicken bone. The chicken bone got lodged in his throat and it caused an infection that proved fatal. So he dies at the age of 56. So tragic ending for Henry Knox. But uh, by the way, I I have to mention that Fort Knox, famous fort in America where the gold supply is kept, or at least I don't know if it still is. We used to joke about breaking into Fort Knox and taking the gold. Fort Knox is named after Henry Knox. There you go. And I believe my hometown, Knoxville, Iowa, which has a statue of General Knox. That too. Yeah, a lot of towns named after a lot of these guys. I think Knoxville, Tennessee as well. Yeah, so I'm from the second largest Knoxville in America, I'm proud to say. But big, <laughs> bigger than Knoxville, Illinois, or Knoxville, Missouri, or whatever little you know podunk Midwestern towns are out there. Mm-hmm. All right, well, going back, moving down our list of generals on the British line, Henry Clinton, he's replaced as commander-in-chief of British forces in 1782 by Sir Guy Carleton. He writes one of the early narratives of the Revolutionary War from the British side, sort of in the way that a lot of Confederate generals write the early histories of the Civil War and try to set down a narrative. He tries to set down a narrative when he publishes in 1783 a narrative of the campaign of 1781 in North America. He is trying to directly lay blame for the campaign's failures on General Cornwallis. Cornwallis does not stand for that. So he issues a response in which he's highly critical of Clinton. Clinton, like a lot of other British generals we see here, serves in Parliament until 1784. Not that he serves until 1784, but serves in Parliament. And then again from 1790 until 1793 when he dies at age of 65. He was on active duty in the army at the time of his death. Well, that's pretty rare. Yeah. (laughs) For people that aren't at the time, for people who aren't killed in battle or something, but. Yeah, good for him. All right, so so much for Clinton. Moving back to the American side, Daniel Morgan, the famous rifle commander, rifle unit commander. Um, he was most prominent, perhaps, at the Battle of Cowpens. Uh, he had some physical issues, though. After the Battle of Cowpens, Morgan's sciatica flared up, and he sat out most of the rest of the war. Uh, probably not literally, though, Scott, because <laughs> <laughs> when you, if you have sciatica, you don't like to sit. At least uh, I don't. I have a little touch of it myself sometimes. But anyway, Morgan resigned his commission and he settled down in Western Virginia. He was briefly recalled to active service during the Whiskey Rebellion in which he was promoted to major general and commanded one half of the militia army sent to put down the rebellion. He ran for Congress as a Federalist in 1794, losing, but then he was elected the next time in 1796 and he served one term. He died in 1802 at the age of 66. Uh, Let me, I do, now that we're, now that I think about it, I would like to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion just for a minute because there's an interesting thing about it. The Whiskey Rebellion was a rebellion by, there were different rebellions in different parts of different states, but the, the main Whiskey Rebellion was farmers in western Pennsylvania who objected to the federal government's pretty heavy tax. I think it was 25% on whiskey that was produced. It was a way the government was raising money, but it really hurt the farmers, obviously, because it was harder for them to sell their whiskey if you had, people had to pay a tax on it. So so they rose up in rebellion. A lot of these farmers were in debt and they were struggling to keep their farms. Well, Washington realized we can't have rebellions popping up all the time. And so Washington ordered an army to go out and put down the rebellion. And Washington actually personally led the army, at least part of the way. Washington put on the uniform and he was still the sitting president. So to this day, Washington remains the first 
and the only U.S. president, sitting president, president at the time, to lead troops in battle. Although, again, I, I should say his presence was more ceremonial than anything else. He marched out a few, a few dozen miles and then handed it over to Alexander Hamilton. And, but anyway, that's just an interesting fun fact. Washington, President Washington led troops in battle. Hmm. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> at least he started. He got them started. And Daniel Morgan was there, too. So playing his part. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Well, the next person on the British side I'm really interested in looking at is Charles Cornwallis because he's a great example that the Revolutionary War is a watershed moment in American history or the genesis, if you will. But it wasn't as big in British history at all. The height of the British Empire's power comes many, many decades after the Revolutionary War. It's not as if this is a terrible crippling blow. It's almost more like a minor setback in the history of the British Empire. It's like saying that the United States was never the same after it lost the Philippines or Cuba. Okay. I mean, no, I mean, in fact, the summit of American power was after that. So you can almost see it like that. And we see that with General Cornwallis because he's not buried in England. He's buried facing the Ganges River. How the heck did he end up in India? Well, as a loyal servant of the British Empire, here's how. When he returned to Britain, to his surprise, he was hailed as a hero for what he did, which is interesting. He had a successful career after his return. He was named as an ambassador to Prussia in 1785. He tried to forge an alliance with Frederick the Great. He was then appointed governor general of India in 1786 and was one of the chief architects of British India. He governed it until 1794 when he was appointed as master of the ordnance. Four years later, he was named Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, where he helped craft the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So he really is architecting some critical features of the British Empire, and India is perhaps one of the most lucrative colonies. He resigns in 1801 and afterward was sent to France to help finalize a peace treaty with Napoleon. This uh, ends the War of the Second Coalition. In 1805, he was again named Governor General of India, He died there of a fever in 1805 at the age of 66 and is buried overlooking the Ganges River. That is Cornwallis. Very interesting. Yes. So he had, among all the British people, uh, the the key figures in the Revolutionary War on the British side, he seems to have had perhaps the most storied post-war career. All right, moving to the Americans, Benjamin Lincoln. Benjamin Lincoln, we saw, was at, at the Battle of Yorktown, was... Washington's second in command. He received the sword from Cornwallis' second in command. Lincoln also had been in charge of the Continental Army in the South fairly early in the war uh, until he was captured. From 1781 to late 1783, Lincoln served as the first United States Secretary of War, Secretary at War, sorry. He resigned in 1783. In 1787, he helped put down Shays' Rebellion. That's another rebellion of angry farmers that occurred before. <laughs> yeah, yet another one. Well, they had grievances and they had a point, but uh, this, was, this was before Washington became president. So this is before the Whiskey Rebellion that I mentioned earlier. Lincoln stayed active in public life in various capacities, including a term as lieutenant governor of Massachusetts and many years as the collector of the port of Boston, and that would have been a very lucrative position. He retired from public life in 1809, and he died the following year at the age of 77. And I have to get it out there. In case anybody's wondering, no, he is not related to Abraham Lincoln. (laughs) Sorry, everyone. Different Lincoln family. All right. Well, our beloved scamp, our sly fox, John Burgoyne, who... Hey, gentleman Johnny! Not a great commander, but no one is better at weaseling out of things than John Burgoyne. We haven't talked about him in a while, Scott. I miss him. Me too. I mean, he sounds like you don't want to command your armies, but, you know, a great pal to meet at the pub for a few tankards of ale sounds like a probably one of the funnest guys to hang out with, I'd say. Yes. So what does he do? He returns to England. He's stripped of command. <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> sounds appropriate. 1782, he, again, weasels himself back into good graces of the empire, and he's given many offices, including commander-in-chief of Ireland. He takes up his pen and he writes many plays, both before and after the war. 
dies in 1792 unexpectedly at the age of 70 and manages to weasel his way when he's dead into Westminster Abbey. So nobody fails upward like John Burgoyne. Just got to give it to him. Yeah, and I think that's a tribute to his playwriting ability. I've never seen any of his plays, but and I don't know that they've stood the test of time, but they were very popular at the time. And Westminster Abbey has a lot of different types of famous British people, but there a lot of playwrights and poets go there. I think it's called Poets' Corner. Is that right, Scott? Something like that. Yeah, it sounds right. So for him to be buried, and and I can't say for sure that he was buried in Poets' Corner, or that it that maybe that it didn't even exist at the time, but. If so, then that's a tribute to his ability as a playwright. He probably was much better as a playwright than he was <laughs> as a general. <laughs> I hope so. Wow. All right. Moving back to the American side, we're now to my second least favorite American general, <laughs> and that is Horatio Gates. Horatio Gates, the man who fled on horseback and rode for his life 180 miles after the disastrous loss that he presi- presided over at the Battle of Camden. Uh, He was sidelined, needless to say, after the Battle of Camden, though he remained in the Army. He was assigned to Washington's staff in 1782, and Washington was at Newburgh, New York. That must have been awkward. (laughs) Oh, great. Thanks, Congress. I really needed this guy back. If you remember, Gates had conspired against Washington, tried tried to get him thrown out of office and take his job. Anyway, Gates left the Army in 1784 and retired to his estate in modern-day West Virginia. At the time, it was just part of Virginia. He sold his Virginia property, freed his slaves, good for him, moved to New York City, served a term in the New York legislature from uh, 1801 to 1803, and he died in the early 1800s. I accidentally, in the notes, I did not put the date, so I'll get that in just a minute because I know our listeners— our demand to know uh, exactly what year did Horatio Gates die? 1806. Gates died in 1806 at the age of 78, and the exact location of his grave is unknown. Hmm. So, listener, I know all of our listeners, Scott, are, are just, they've put seeing Horatio Gates' grave on their bucket <laughs> list, but sorry, not going to happen. That would be the most disappointing field trip you could ever take or show your children something. But yeah, really. You know, then again, Scott, maybe we've got an ambitious young listener who wants to make that their PhD project and then <laughs> they can become famous as the discoverer of Horatio Gates's grave. So if you want to do that, listener, go for it. I encourage you. <laughs> there we go. The plot of National Treasure 3, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. The... All right. Well, going back to the British, not such a lovable scamp like John Burgoyne, Bannister Tarleton. Oh, bloody ban. Yep. The basis of the villain in The Patriot. He returns to Great Britain and, again, tries to win the battle of ideas there. He wrote a history of experience in the war called Campaigns of 1780 and 1781 in the Southern Provinces of North America. So, of course, he portrays his own actions as favorable, probably downplays all of his burning and everything else. Uh, Questions decisions made by Cornwallis. He's then elected to the House of Commons in 1790 and held his seat until 1812. He rises to the rank of general in the army, but never leads troops in battle. He uses his political position to fight William Wilberforce as a defender of the slave trade. He dies in 1833 at the age of 78 and lives to see slavery abolished in the British Empire. So isn't really on the right side of a lot of different uh, historical events, let us say. Not somebody we want to emulate. (laughs) Yeah, not a very nice guy. So, well, uh, so James, the next person on the revolutionary side, is he your least favorite general? He is my least favorite. I said a minute ago, Horatio Gates was my second least favorite. And that, of course, uh, begs the question, who is your least favorite? And listener, I bet you can guess it is Charles Lee. Oh, I don't like Charles Lee. Lee tried to get Congress to overturn his court martial's guilty verdict. But this didn't work, of course. And when this failed, he made open attacks on Washington's character. And that just, (laughs) he's digging the hole deeper and deeper. It's like, Washington was terrible. Washington was a jerk. Washington was power hungry. Uh, No, you just make yourself look silly, Charles. Lee's popularity plummeted, of course. And we mentioned this before, but let's mention it again. And once again, here's John Lawrence. He keeps popping up. 
he's died, but now we're, we're going back in time, so he's still alive. Colonel John Lawrence, who was an aide to Washington, challenged Charles Lee to a duel in which Lee was wounded in his side. And again, this became the basis of the song Ten Dual Commandments in the Hamilton musical. Bum, ba, da, dun. Lee was released from his duty on January 10, 1780. He retired to his property in the Shenandoah Valley where he bred horses and dogs. I think he was better with animals than people. Okay, yeah, <laughs> hope so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, great dog breeder. Uh, <laughs> while visiting Philadelphia, he was stricken with fever and died in a tavern on October 2nd, 1782 at the age of only 50. Not a happy ending for Charles Lee. Hmm. All right, well, my next one is Benedict Arnold, which I think, if there's anyone that I've really grown fascinated by in this series, it's him because he's like a Shakespearean tragic figure or a, a character out of Dostoevsky, like a Raskolnikov who does terrible things, but you get deep into his mind and you see the justification justifications for what he does, even if you don't agree with it, or if you think it's an act of self delusion of what he's doing. Uh, so he has reasons to be upset, but, then goes off and does things that squanders maybe the goodwill that he's built up. So what does he do after he defects to the British side? He goes to England in 1781. He is not welcomed by British society. He's snubbed. Perhaps they don't trust him or think he's just a, a mercenary. He becomes active in trade in the West Indies and is also involved in several lawsuits in one duel. When the French Revolution breaks out, Arnold outfits a um, he outfits a privateer while continuing to do business in the West Indies. He's imprisoned by French authorities in Guadalupe amid accusations of spying for the British and eludes hanging by escaping to the British fleet after bribing his guards. He dies in London in 1801 at the age of 61. Despite being a general, his funeral is conducted without military honor. So. I don't know. Is he mostly a pariah in English society after he goes there? I don't know that he was a pariah, but he was never really accepted by the British. He was truly a man without a country. Mm -hmm. I guess he thought maybe the British would receive him with open arms and get, shower him with honors and money and estates and things, but it just didn't happen. Yeah. So that's Benedict Arnold for you. All right. Now, the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette had a long and distinguished career after the American Revolution. Immediately after the war ended, he served as an advisor to America's envoys to Europe, including John Jay, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, and a who's who of famous founding fathers. Lafayette worked with Jefferson to establish trade agreements between the United States and France, which aimed to reduce America's debt to France. He also joined the French abolitionist group, the Society of the Friends of the Blacks, which advocated the end of the slave trade and equal rights for free blacks. He urged the emancipation of slaves and their establishment as tenant farmers in a 1783 letter to Washington, who, of course, was a slave owner. Uh, that plan didn't go anywhere, <laughs> needless to say. In 1789, he was elected to the States General in Paris, which set in motion the French Revolution. Lafayette was appointed as commander-in-chief of the Revolutionary National Guard of France. And he tried to help steer the revolution on a moderate course, but, of course, that didn't happen, and things got out of control. He was eventually labeled as a traitor by Robespierre, and he had to flee Paris. But despite his status as a so-called traitor, Lafayette commanded troops in the war against Austria, but he was captured and imprisoned by the Austrians in 1792. He was held prisoner for five years, but was released in 1797. Napoleon restored his citizenship in 1800. And after this, Lafayette retired from military life. He returned to America in 17, I'm sorry, 1824, staying for 16 months and visiting all 24 states at the time. This is a great triumphal tour. He was hailed as a hero everywhere he went. He was feted, banquets were thrown, parties were had, uh, speeches were made. And he went back and died in Paris in 1830 at the age of 76. So in, not counting his being labeled as a traitor in the five years in prison, I think Lafayette uh, had a pretty good life after the revolution. Yeah, that's a positive, uplifting thing, an antidote to Tarleton or Benedict Arnold, someone who leads a more noble life and 
you know, if Robespierre, he's going to label anyone a traitor, and that's it's part of the radical French Revolution. He gets guillotined himself. I think that's just desserts. Speaking of people who are killed, my last British is a person <laughs> yeah. is John Andre. So not much to say. We know that he is found. He is hanged, not hung. His remains are exhumed in 1821 and reinterred with honors in Westminster Abbey. So that's really all I have to say about John Andre. Yeah, you know, I always kind of feel sorry for John Andre. I mean, the man, he seems to have been a decent human being. He was just doing his job. And he was another one of these bon vivant types like... Uh, like uh, Burgoyne. Senior moment. Thank you, Burgoyne. Yes. Uh, he was an artist. He was a... I think he wrote plays. He... He loved classical music. He's a major character in the show I mentioned, Turn, Washington Spies, and he's he's given a very sympathetic portrayal. And a lot of Americans, uh, even military officers during the Revolution, were opposed to his execution and tried to get his sentence commuted. He wanted to be, Andre himself asked if he could be executed by firing squad, which was considered more honorable than being hung, hanged, hung, hanged. I, I'm just as bad as you with that. But anyway, Washington, I think Washington was was still seething from Benedict Arnold's treachery. And since Andre was a big part of that, Washington wanted to humiliate Andre. So he ordered that he be hanged, hanged. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, well, all the English teachers out there. We saw one foreigner who is exalted and celebrating American society our other person, Beren von Steuben, what happens to him after the war? Uh, jawohl, that is good. Um, von Steuben became a U.S. citizen by act of the Pennsylvania legislature in March 1784. With the war over, he resigned from service and he first settled at his retreat on Manhattan Island, where he became a prominent figure and an elder in the German Reformed Church. From 1785 until his death in 1784, I'm uh, 1794. He served as president of the German Society of the City of New York. That seems appropriate. That was a charitable society founded to assist German immigrants. Von Steuben later moved upstate and settled in Oneida County on a small estate in the vicinity of Rome, New York, on land granted him for his military service and a place where he had spent summers. He was later appointed a regent for what evolved into the University of the State of New York. He died in 1794 at the age of 64. Interestingly enough, many cities throughout the U.S., and I did not know this prior to researching this series, but many cities throughout the U.S. celebrate a festival in von Steuben's honor called von Steuben Day. In many places, this event is considered the German-American event of the year. Participants march, dance, wear German costumes, and play German music, and the event is attended by millions of people. The German-American Steuben Parade is held annually in September in New York City. So how about that? I, I'm sure some of our listeners knew that and probably even attended some, but I had no idea. If von Steuben was so involved in the affairs of Germans in America, it's almost certainly possible that he came across Hessians who had deserted but were trying to blend in in American life. And I could see von Steuben looking at someone a little bit cockeyed and saying, how did you come to America? Oh, I'm just a Mennonite. No, I immigrated for religious freedom. But you seem very handy with a rifle and know everything about military maneuvers. How do you know that? Oh, um, hey, look at the time. I've got to be going. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't make me have to slap you. All right. You know how to cuss him out in German. So I think the last person, James, you definitely need to take this. Oh, yeah. I love this guy. Alexander Hamilton. There we go. One more time. I, I, I'm not going to promise it won't happen in the final episode, but... Anyway, Hamilton. After the Battle of Yorktown, Hamilton resigned his commission and was appointed to the Confederation Congress as a representative from New York. He served until 1783 when he passed the bar, meaning he became a lawyer. He resigned from Congress and he set up a law practice. He played major roles in the Annapolis Convention of 1785. That was kind of a predecessor to the Constitutional Convention. And then, of course, he played a prominent role in the Constitutional Convention itself in 1787. Along with James Madison and John Jay, Hamilton wrote a series of essays collectively called the Federalist Papers, which argued in favor of the new federal constitution. And I have to say, Hamilton was an absolute workaholic. This man, uh, in the musical, they say, man, the guy is nonstop. 
he worked and worked and worked. I don't think he ever slept, or if he did, he didn't sleep much. For example, of the 85 essays in The Federalist, uh, he wrote 51 of them, so more than half. Uh, as I've mentioned before, he was appointed Secretary of the Treasury by President Washington, and in that role, he played a foundational, a crucial role in setting up the new nation's economic infrastructure. Some would go as far as to say that Hamilton single-handedly invented our economic system. Uh, that's probably a little much, but but he certainly played a huge role in it. He also played a key role in forming the Federalist Party, one of the first two political parties, or proto-parties, perhaps, but... He resigned from the cabinet in 1795 to practice law. He wanted to make some money, <laughs> but he remained active in politics behind the scenes. He played a key role in denying the presidency to John Adams and Aaron Burr in 1800. He helped uh, persuade people. And Adams was the sitting president at the time, but he got people not to vote for Adams and then, then not to vote for Aaron Burr. He also helped defeat Aaron Burr in his bid for governor of New York in 1804. So you can imagine Burr, <laughs> Burr is not happy with Hamilton. <laughs> Even though they had been on friendly terms in the past, they'd worked together some, they'd both served in the Continental Army. Um, Hamilton doesn't think Burr is good for the country and didn't, didn't want him to be a leader uh, in the government. So not surprisingly, uh, by the way, Hamilton also insulted Burr in print, and Burr, as a result, fa challenges him to a duel. This is everybody knows about this. And in the duel, of course, Hamilton was mortally wounded, and he died on July 12th, 1804, at the age of either 47 or 49. We're not sure exactly what year Hamilton was born in. It was probably 1755 or 1757. So a very extremely off the charts, genius, talented guy. Uh, but so many fatal flaws, so proud, so he couldn't stop running his mouth. Uh, and he pays for his character flaws and his life is cut off before he even reached 50. So a tragic ending to an otherwise brilliant career. Probably alongside Benjamin Franklin, he's the most influential person in American history who was not himself president. And James and I said at the end of our Civil War series that what the Civil War did was decide the question of whether the United States would be Alexander Hamilton's America or Thomas Jefferson's America. The, Thomas Jefferson's vision, which is basically the polar opposite of Alexander Hamilton, was a decentralized United States full of gentlemen farmers, more agrarian, not having a powerful central government that would finance large public works projects through the Treasury and then industrialize after the Civil War, things are very clearly going in the direction of Hamilton's America, not Jefferson's. Many people, many writers bemoan this fact and wish we were in Jefferson's America, not Hamilton's America. So he is still a figure of contemporary concern and contemporary interest by people who support his vision and people who are against his vision. So whether you know it or not, you are affected by Hamil Alexander Hamilton, whether you are or not in the United States, because he is affecting many of the ideas of the most powerful nation in the world. So quite a legacy, wouldn't you say? Yes. And if people want to learn more about Hamilton, besides the musical, you got to, okay, watch the musical or at least listen to the songs. But the musical is based on a famous award-winning biography of him written by Ron Chernow. Uh, it's just called Hamilton, a biography, I believe. I listened to it a few years ago on audio. Chernow is a great biographer. He's written a fantastic biography of Washington as well as Hamilton. So both of those, if you really want to learn a ton about those two men, those are the books to read. Chernow is perhaps the most thorough biographer out there. His books are about eight or 900 pages long. So yeah, it's a big commitment, right? He, he gets you in. I mean, he is very thorough. All right. Well, that is what happened to everyone, but Again, James and I are completionists, and we want to telescope out and look at the very big picture of what the Revolutionary War meant. What were the long-term impacts of the war? Was it simply something that established the United States? Would history have mostly gone on the same if the United States or the Continental Congress had lost and remained part of the British Empire? Or did it cause irrevocable changes in world history? We'll look at that question in the next and last episode of the series on key battles in the Revolutionary War. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. 
If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of Madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.